Hey everybody, it's Bob, and this is Bob Saget's here for you because that's the thing that you clicked on. This is a really important episode, I feel, because um, there's not a lot of people that, that we can rely on uh, facts sometimes about what's going on with the coronavirus, With and don't go, oh, I don't want to hear about that. This is a man who, Dr. John LaPook, he is the chief medical correspondent at CBS News. He is an amazing man. I have the pleasure of knowing him. Um, he is he's a doctor. He could have chosen not to be a doctor anymore, but he is not only a professor of medicine at NYU School of Medicine um, and uh, the Mabane professor of gastroenterology, which I say every five minutes, at NYU Lagone Health. And he's a practicing physician. He practices every day. And he actually does it. He doesn't just practice. He is an amazing man. He's won Emmy Awards. He has won the Peabody Award for his broadcasting. But more than that, he is a humanitarian. And he knows a hell of a lot about what's going on. He's in constant contact with everybody at the CDC. He's always, because of his being literally the chief medical correspondent at CBS, which is obviously one of the best news sources in broadcasting that we have out of the United States and, uh, and the world, you can really uh, listen and understand what he's saying. He, he speaks like uh, better than I do, but who doesn't? So without any further ado, you know what to do with this podcast. You rate, review it, you subscribe, subscribe, and listen, or follow, or you can go to the YouTube page. You know, it's all there. And I don't know what to say, except it's a pleasure to introduce a guy that I wish was my doctor. He is a doctor for all of us. It's a, a person, John is a person that you should listen to and watch whenever you get a chance, when he's on 60 Minutes, or when he's on CBS This Morning, or when he's doing any reports for CBS, and just uh, seek him out, because he is a he is a speaker of truth and empathy and and love of humanity and wanting to wrap his hands around this pandemic that we've been going through and how we're going to get out of this together. So with no further ado, here is Dr. Jonathan LaPook. So um, I get to call you John, but uh, doc, Dr. LaPook is how, Dr. John LaPook is how the, the world looks at you because of, you know, you're the chief medical, you're the big uh, macher, which is a word that means a, a very nice man at CBS News, which is, for me, one of the most respectable news organizations, I think, for me. Yeah, I'm the chief medical correspondent for CBS News, so I do... The evening news and uh, 60 Minutes, CBS This Morning, and uh, CBS Sunday Morning Radio, all that stuff. It's Now, you, you're you doing this all day long, right? So this is, you're up at 4.30 in the morning sometimes? No, it's so, you know, I have, I have this great life. It really is in terms of education, in terms of staying high on the learning curve. So I, believe it or not, I'm still practicing medicine. So I'm a professor of medicine at uh, NYU Langone Health, and i um, I am an internist and a gastroenterologist, but I'm one of these dinosaurs who actually likes internal medicine. So even though I'm a specialist, I actually see more patients for internal medicine. So in the morning, probably four days a week, usually occasionally a fifth, I'm seeing patients from, you know, eight in the morning till noon, maybe one could be a little bit longer than that. And then in the afternoon, I go over to CBS. Well, I don't go to CBS anymore, but uh, now that we're doing remote um, broadcasting, which is a whole other amazing thing. But right. uh I, uh, my office was at uh, about 10, 15 minutes away from 57th and 10th, which is where the CBS uh, News Broadcast Center is. So it'd be great. I, 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 used to, I used to work in that building. Before they gave it back to the news division, they gave it to the entertainment division. And I got fired from a show called The Morning Program. And then, thank God, CBS News took over again. <laughs> Oh, I didn't know that. What was the what was the morning program? It was, that that's what everyone will always ask. It was uh, <laughs> with Rollin Smith, the uh, the local newscaster in in the New York area, 
and uh, Marriott Hartley, actress, uh, they, the two of them together were the hosts, and I was the third sidekick, and then uh, Mark McEwen did the weather. Um, very sweet man. Uh, he was the uh, weatherman, but then when I left, he became the third wheel. But they were trying to do comedy in the morning and make it more entertaining for people like Drive Radio. And mm -hmm. it was a good, good, good intent, but I think people really... When I watch the news in the morning, I, I do tend, not just because you're here right now, to go to CBS because it I, I'm looking for the least biased of mm -hmm. information that I can get. And knowing you now, because we both, and I'm going to be talking about you a lot because I think literally the world of you, um, you're, I mean, I feel like we're related somehow. Somehow <laughs> if you go to some DNA there's, somewhere. There's some little shtetl in Eastern Europe. <laughs> It's somewhere we had to run from. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> but well, but you're uh, of course it's it's your wife is an angel, Kate, and um, you have two beautiful sons and uh, Daniel and Noah, and and Norman Lear is your father-in-law, which he is one of the most important people in my life that I love so much, and so. People are going to want to know some stuff, and that's why I wanted to record this really right before, just a couple days before they're hearing it right this moment, because everything that's happening in the world yeah. with COVID is changes every hour. Um, it, it, kind it, of, it, it, so. it's certain, yeah. It's the one thing predictable about this virus is has been that it's unpredictable. Uh, right. But um, yeah, I won the father-in-law sweepstakes. <laughs> <laughs> I really did. I hit the jackpot. It's been. He's one of my best friends. You yeah. know, what's better than that? Be your father-in-law. And that's where this organically happened, where I asked you to do the podcast, because we do a thing called Cigar Night, which used to be live, and we would all hang out um, and smoke cigars, play music. A lot of people from Concord Music, when when Norman was, started it years ago, and we sit around, we play songs, we would eat, we would drink, and all we would do is ask you constantly since <laughs> COVID hit, when can we be with Norman live? And it was wonderful that you were on that Zoom call with us the other night because it was the first time you were there the whole time, and mm -hmm. it, it meant a lot. So one of your main purposes besides your patience, besides – helping the nation understand what they're going through right now, what our, what our world is going through, is to take care of the precious gift that is Norman Lear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that, that, <laughs> that, I told you, hashtag don't kill Norman Lear. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I was trying to convince everybody to be super careful. And look, you know, I, it, this, this whole pandemic has been grueling. It's been devastating. It's been emotionally taxing uh, in ways that we don't even know yet. I really worry about the effects down the line, especially for kids and that generation who is going to have some degree of what's called ACEs, adverse childhood events. Um, but for, for it's a risk benefit thing in terms of how careful you are. I mean, hopefully everybody's as careful as they possibly could be. But Norman was 97 and change when the pandemic started, he turned 98 on uh, July 27th, 2020. And, uh, you know, he was in the group that, that, if he got COVID, it would have been a real, real problem. So you all, I mean, thank you all for being so understanding and everybody around him in his life. I was a bit of a, a you know, a, a, I was I was very strict in terms of keeping him safe you're, and all you're protocol. wonderful. And I, I did have the advantage, of course, I'm following this for 60 Minutes and CBS News. And so I, I'm talking almost every day to world leaders about this including Tony Fauci um, and Francis Collins who's the head of the NIH and a lot of scientists. So I did have really my, my thing around the pulse. You don't have to be smart. You just have to know somebody smart. So and I know all these smart people who were able to give me information. And I'm so happy that Norman is now fully vaccinated. Uh, so the risk goes way down. It's not zero, but it's way down. And we can start to get I think as a nation, we're all aching for it to try to get back to some semblance of normality, not normal. It's going to be a new normal, as everybody's talking about. But, you know, when you're vaccinated, we're talking about the carrots and the sticks. You know, the carrots, which the CDC just talked about a couple of days ago, is what can you do now that you're vaccinated? You can do a lot of things. So I think it should be incentive for people. 
And that's for people that are open to listening and trying, and where do they get their information? Because there's so many different sources and who do you trust? And, you know, and then J&J goes off the market and then comes back. And then I, I'm, I liked that they personally, I liked that they took it off because they were that cautious. And then they put it back with the right label. They could have just put the label on it, but they did it with their baby powder and that was a problem. <laughs> you know, Bob, I completely agree with you. And I know there was some controversy. Why did they even say anything, right? This was the J&J vaccine. And it turned out uh, once there was some monitoring that went on that for women, one in a million women over the age of 50 and seven in a million women under the age of 50 developed a rare type of clotting associated with low platelet count. Platelets are the parts of the red cell of the uh, blood cells that help you to clot. So they could have just said, okay, that's a rare, super rare side effect. And, you know, we'll just keep going. But the fact that they made it public, they were totally transparent. They had hearings. Um, to me, that should give people confidence because one of the big complaints that I hear, one of the big questions from people who are vaccine hesitant, they say, it, it hasn't been around long enough. I, I'm, I'm going to wait and see. So right now, it's very interesting. The last, last poll that um, was done found that about 20% of Americans say they're never going to take it. They're, never, they're, they're basically not going to take the vaccine. I think it's right. 17, 13% are never going to take it. And, and 7% say they'll take it if it's mandated. All right, so let's say 20% aren't going to take it. Um, we want to get to about 75 to 80% vaccination to get herd immunity. Although even earlier, even, even you know, 60% of people vaccinated is still substantial. As we're seeing in Israel, they're around that number. and They have dramatic fall in the number of cases and hospitalizations and deaths. But um, so let's look at that other 80%. Well, it turns out that 17% of the country is on the fence. They're waiting to see. Now, that was 39% in December. And it's 17% last month in, in March. And where do they get these percentages from? I always go, what's yeah, your source Kaiser for the family, numbers? The Kaiser Family Foundation is a wonder. This is not Kaiser Permanente. People get confused. It's Kaiser right. Family Foundation, a nonprofit that does um, very respected work. Uh, where, and then they they uh, do polls. Uh, but they're they're not biased um, as far as I'm, I've am i seen over the years. They're really straight down the middle of the road. And they they uh, they... they they're one of the places that we trust to go for information. So 17% of people say uh, we're on the fence. We got to get those 17%. And how do you do that? Well, your question, we're talking back to the, getting back to the J and J vaccine. If I'm in the group saying, well, it hasn't been around long enough and to really be tested, there have been 74,000 people were in the test for Moderna plus Pfizer. If you add them together, hundreds of millions of people have now gotten vaccines. Right. And they're picking up a one in a million or seven in a million if you're under 50 and you're a woman, kind of a side effect. If, if, if I'm worried about it, I'm looking at this. Wow, that is that's a pretty good monitoring system. Now, there could be some other rare side effects and they're going to they're going to keep monitoring that. But the other thing that people should know, and this is something I don't wish on them, but I'm I'm the guy who sat through the hours and hours and hours of the uh, conference that the advisory committee uh, ACIP to the CDC had. And, and they, this was on Zoom, right? This was it was on Zoom. And and Bob, you know, to hear these are world experts in immunology and epidemiology, virology, physicians, public health. They the seriousness that they brought to this discussion, the nuance, how careful they were modeling studies, uh, so thoughtful and meticulous. And just picking apart the data, to me, it, it was just, they've trained their whole life. It's like the Olympics, you know, they've trained their whole life for this moment and put them in. You know, a lot of them have been on the sidelines in the last four years, but now they're in, they're in the game again. Are these uh, the people that also worked on SARS? Are these the people that, because oh. I, I always hear, one of the things that I, I get frustrated about is that, I hear now, oh no, this has been around for 10 years, 20 years. It's, it's a virus we've been working on. We just added the component, and you spoke about this the other night when we talked. Yeah. They added the component that is COVID to yeah. an already existing formula. I know yeah. nothing about anything, it, by the way. It's, it's very good. It sounded really good. Good, good, good bluffing. Um, <laughs> no, but, but no, that's, you're actually right on. 
you're right on on target there. So uh, that gets to the that gets to the second the second thing that people worry about, which is it was the, the vaccine was developed so quickly. Um, how is that possible? They must have rushed it. So the the end of the the end of the the, the first thing, which was how can they pick up? You know, are, are, has it been out there long enough in order to pick up side effects? I just was talking about how serious they are discussing it. And now if I'm at home, great. I don't have to read the articles myself. Serious people are looking at this and we can trust them. And I really believe that. And I've been very skeptical. I interviewed the head of the FDA, what Steve Hahn, uh, last fall. And I, you know, as, as a lot of people did, we were pressuring them, you know, are you sure no corners were cut? So, you know, this was an open hearing and, you know, he said, no, no corners have been cut. And in fact, uh, the previous administration wanted the emergency use authorization done before the election. And it, and it, and it wasn't done before the election because they, they, the FDA said, no, we're sticking to our guns. Got to be a couple of months of safety data that, that won't be ready by the time the election is there. So I, having really been one of those people in the press as a journalist who, who are pressuring people, you sure, you sure, you sure that no corners are cut, cut at this point. Looking at the process, I do have a lot of confidence that uh, that very serious people are looking at this meticulously, and that they're, uh, as far as we know, there have been no corner, no safety corners cut. So it gets to the second one, which you brought up, which is how could it possibly have been developed in a couple of months? So let's right. go over that slowly. I so I was on the special last night after the State of the Union address, uh, and I got like a minute forty to quickly say all this. So it's not. It's so nice. To you, be have, you have you have three minutes if you want. Three minutes. <laughs> you, I came you have home. an hour. You could I literally can. talk for an hour about a bunion if you want. <laughs> Tell I, me about how to deal with gas. My favorite bunion is Paul. No. So I, I come back. <laughs> he's a and, big man. Uh, <laughs> he's a big sorry. Guy. I, I, I can't help myself. I'm so I, sorry. I shouldn't be improving with you. I want to. <laughs> I do want to hear what you're saying. Yeah, okay. If I go I'm, off on a tangent, it's the end of everything. The uh, I, I'm enjoying it. I came back and Norman said they have you talking so quickly, which is very true. You know, because there was a there was a, a senator who, who was waiting and she had a heart out, and they you know it's tough in the news. The, the the evening news is like they get really it's a half hour, but it's like 21 minutes. Yeah, you think about commercials, so. You're on like this. So it's nice to be able to explain things slowly. So folks listening to this, this is something that listen up for this one, because when you look at people, when you listen to people who are vaccine hesitant, this is one of the first things they say, which is it was developed too quickly. It actually wasn't developed too quickly. This was based on technology that's been around for decades. And um, I went over this very careful with the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and I got their timeline on this. And back in 2003 was SARS-1. And around that time, they developed a vaccine that took 20 months to develop. And over the years, as you got H1N1, which was swine flu, right. and then you know, and Zika, uh, Ebola, and then Zika, it bird, got bird flu was uh, bird. No, no, thank God that was H5N1. And th that never really hit big because that was much more deadly. But that was something that really scared a lot of us. But in terms right. of things they actually tried to make a vaccine for, um, it got shorter and shorter in time that it took to develop it. And that's because they were using something called platform technology and platform technology. Very briefly, I actually asked. Um, I gave my analogy to Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, and he came up with a better one. Um, but my analogy was, it's like, you know, you have this vaccine and it's been developed for one thing, say uh, Zika. So in 2016, the Zika vaccine took three months. So you, you take that vaccine, you unscrew the part of it that makes it specific for Zika. You screw on the part that makes it specific for uh, SARS-CoV-2 and boom, you don't have to reinvent the whole wheel. So he said, that's, that's, that's okay, and he, but here's mine and his is better. He said, imagine you have a factory that's making a widget and you decide I'm gonna make a new widget. You don't have to have a new factory, a new assembly line, fire everybody and hire new people. You get a new mold and then you make the new widget based on stuff that you already have around. Right. So there was this technology that was existing having to do with messenger RNA. It's really stunning technology. Uh, technological tour de force. Um, and, and where uh, is this being explored? Was it in labs? Explored, the National Institutes of Health, the Vaccine Center, 
And um, where is that for people that don't even that's know? That's in Maryland. That's in Maryland. Um, and Kismekia Corbett, who's this wonderful woman who's very, uh, very involved with it. She, you know, I, I went up there and I interviewed her and she was so excited. Uh, and it was, she was telling me this, this was, um, I think this was before the vaccine. So on January 10th, 2020, um, the Chinese published the genetic code for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the uh, Kismekia Corbett was telling me she, she saw it online. She got it. She spoke to somebody in the lab. I think it was a Friday uh, because she said, uh, he said, um, you got, they got, they published the, the sequence. And she goes, yeah, he goes, I guess there goes my weekend. And she said, yes. <laughs> but by Monday, through computers, they already had basically the formula for how to make, how to modify based on stuff they had done, research they had done on other coronaviruses. Remember, coronaviruses are a family. Four of them actually are responsible for the common cold. There are other ones, but they're, they're and then there's, then there's SARS-CoV-1, which was, the first SARS, which is deadly, but fortunately kind of died out back in the early 2000s, 2003. Right. And then there's SARS-CoV-2. So they, it's, it's kind of very technical, but basically you're rearranging the, the, uh, some of the genetic blueprint so that the 3D confirmation, the way it's shaped of this spike protein that we've all been hearing about, that spike protein so important because it's on the, the virus and it's the it's the thing that allows the virus to attach to and that's the thing that we see images of stuff. that's the round damage. thing with all the suckers on right. it with all coronavirus the coronavirus is corona like a crown right, right. that's so why that's, it has all the little spikes the spike. yeah that's why it looks like that that's why it, it, yeah and, and does it, it look like that under a microscope yeah it has like a little spiky spiky look that's uh, cute that's they, very cute <laughs> yeah yeah that's so you're the first person, Bob, who's called this deadly <laughs> virus. It's an adorable, deadly disease. Um, so anyway, so that was January 10th. It's published. I, it's either it's about two months and change, either 63 days or 65 days. I've heard both uh, later. They actually, Moderna up in, uh, in Massachusetts had the vaccine ready to go into testing. So it took two months. Zika took three months. So... It's not like somebody said, let's go make a virus. We can use my mother's barn. It, right. was, it was based on technology. So that's paid for folks by your taxpayer dollars. So this and was that, Moderna was funded by the government or was that there so, on their own? Moderna is, is a private company, but um, and Pfizer did their work on a similar messenger. It's called messenger RNA technology. They, they actually did all that on their own, although there was a relationship with Project uh, Operation Warp Speed in terms of buying buying it and distributing it. But um, the NIH for decades has been working um, on this vaccine research center that uh, Tony Fauci told me that it was with uh, President, o President Clinton. He was meeting with him all, you know, he's, Tony is a, Tony Fauci is a national hero. He's a personal hero of mine. Uh, and and I, uh, I, I met him years ago. I don't think people realize that AIDS, what they were able to do with the drug cocktails, he was he, he was he was deep, that. that's a whole other story and how how he he um there was a lot of confrontation that happened in those early days uh, between um AIDS activists, you know, and, and for good reason and the government. And he uh brought brought people together. He didn't get and his that's back. what his expertise is is bringing yeah, yeah, the yeah. great minds of science together. Yeah. He's and he's just we'll talk about him in a second because there, there's stuff about him that that's that's just so great. But anyway, he was leaving the uh, the Oval Office with Clinton and Clinton said, you know, is there anything we can do? And he goes, yeah, we need to have a vaccine, an actual center where all this vaccine research happens. And uh, he turned to his chief of staff and said, can we do that? And he goes, yeah. So that's why there is a physical vaccine research center at the NIH. The National Institutes of Health is amazing. It's all these series of many, many buildings and all of this research is going on. And then there's some clinical stuff going on. So it's like bed, bench to bed, they call it, you know, because you, you, you do something, you run it upstairs and try it. You right. know, and actually in a clinical trial. So but that's what Moderna did. They, they figured it out in a couple of months and then they, then they started test Moderna trials. Moderna got the, Moderna got the, the, the instructions for how to make it, how to make the, uh, using a messenger RNA. And, and again, not to, but why not? We have the time. 
messenger RNA is a piece of genetic material that basically instructs your body to make how to how to, to make proteins. So instead of having to get attacked by the virus, get sick, and then have your immune system say, oh, okay, uh, I, I better prepare for the next time. They're actually just giving the, a little part of the virus. Doesn't hurt, can't hurt you because the whole rest of the virus isn't there. Mm-hmm. It's just the spike protein that's there. Uh, can't replicate, can't do anything. And it's giving a sniff to your immune system of what this virus is like, you know, like you would give to a, to a, a, a hound dog or to, you know, and but, say, but it works the same as a flu vaccine. Basically you're, yeah, it works a little different than than because it's just a little piece. This is messenger RNA, and and it's going to be great for the future. That's basically the ability to give the body instructions, genetics instructions, is make this, and so it make the spike protein. But in the future, it could be make this uh, um, immune response that attacks the can the very cancer that you have right now. Mm-hmm. We're going to train your own immune system, so it's going to have great great application in the future. But um, so they, the NIH developed the tech, the, and, and also, you know, it was a private public partnership. There's been research both in the government and also private, private labs, institutions, academia uh, coming together and saying, here's how you do it. Uh, but that's, that's a whole other podcast. But anyway, they gave the, the recipe, so to speak, to Moderna, and they knew how to make it because it's tricky to make it. And they have to surround the instructions in this kind of lipoprotein, this lipid surrounding so that uh, it could, because it's very, it could otherwise be destroyed when you uh, inject it, it would just sort of disintegrate. So you got to keep it whole. I think a lot of layman listeners like myself, they just want to know, they think of physics class, they think of chemistry. So is there a Bunsen burner, a centrifuge or a ripple tank involved in (laughs) any of this? Does anything we ever learned in school, is any of it applied besides a microscope to look at it? Yeah, I mean, uh, you remember last Thursday you used the Henderson Hasselbach equation to figure out your taxes? Absolutely. I, I and I used it on my calculator with my logarithms. A lot of this stuff sneaks up on you in ways that you don't even realize. And I will say that arithmetic is probably the most important thing, mm-hmm. you know, uh, and <laughs> algebra. But um, <laughs> it's very, very rare that you're going to need calculus. But, uh, you know, right. for people who are in science like me, and who get turned on by it, it's just, it is a building block. You know, you can't learn, you can't just start learning the eighth thing. You got to know one and then one goes to two. And it's all built built on each other. But um, anyway, the, the bottom line is that the, uh, the vaccine was then started to be made and went into trial in March. Now this was two months, March, 2020 was two months before Operation Warp Speed even started. Right. So, I know that that term Operation Warp Speed, it was kind of a tough term because it sort of implied to people that it's going so fast that it's like too fast, maybe. But, so, but it, was, it was a very positive thing. It is one of the more positive uh, through the government. I, and I was just missions. about to say that, that what Operation Warp Speed did, and you have to give them credit. And I said yeah. this last night on national television after the State of the Union, you got to give them credit for this, which is once you had... The, vac- the vaccine in hand, and you were doing stage one, phase one, phase two, phase three. And for people who don't know, phase one is a very small safety study. What's the dose that we should give? And, you know, is it relatively safe in small numbers? Phase two is bigger numbers where you're starting to see safety, but also does it work? And phase three is the big, you know, larger numbers, thousands or tens of thousands of people to see, you know, over a longer period of time, does it work? What are the side effects? Things like that. Normally, it would it could take years to get a vaccine from the time you have it in your hand till it's tested, and it's and it's uh, or even years from the time you say let's make a vaccine, because right. you know that was made so so quickly compared to what the polio vaccine how long that took. Um, so, what Operation Warp Speed did was it cut the red tape without cutting corners. It was all hands on deck for everybody at the FDA. Uh, and normally there's a pause between phase one, phase two, phase three. They say, let's look at the data. Let's analyze it. Let's see, does it make sense? It was just, uh, it, it was continuous. And they said, but they had a safety safety monitoring saying, if any safety signal comes up, we're going to stop this. And so it happened very, very quickly. And that summer of 2020, 
uh, more, you know, thousands and then tens of thousands of people were tested. And by the time they got the emergency use authorization, it's an authorization, it's not approved yet, but it's an emergency use authorization. There were 74,000 people in the Pfizer and Moderna combined trials, 30,000 for Moderna and uh, 44,000 for Pfizer. See how arithmetic is important? Exactly. 30,000 plus 44,000. I can do that. I can do that math. I have a yeah. calculator on my phone. But the question I have is, were those people already, was it already succeeding in those people, those yes. test trials? So that was the thing where they said. That's where December, the miracle happened? Is that December, kind of. You know, we were hoping, okay, what do you need for herd immunity? There's different ways of calculating it. You know, I don't want everybody to turn this off, so I'm not going to talk about calculating herd immunity and what you need. <laughs> but people think, you know, maybe 70, 80 percent. You know, maybe a little bit less, but but around that around that number, um, we were hoping. Everybody was hoping that. And Tony Fauci said, "You know, if we get seventy percent, I do an amazing Tony Fauci." You do actually. <laughs> if you could just lower yourself, can you sit on something uh, shorter? No, I. <laughs> You're a stool. <laughs> you know, we did a we did a piece, uh, we did a piece on Zika in 2016, and six for sixty minutes. And um, there was a shot where I'm walking with him and the shot was from high up and it's an outside shot. And um, I'm walking right next to him and he's, I don't know, five, seven or so, something right. like that. I'm six, three. So on Facebook, I got a, uh, one, a question. My wife and I are having an argument. She says you're eight feet tall. <laughs> I think you're only seven and a half feet tall. So well, anyway, but Tony Fauci, bring me back to this, well, whatever the heck we were talking about. But Tony Fauci, I got to digress here because Tony Fauci was the captain of his high school, Brooklyn high school basketball team. Oh, I had no said, idea of this. He was very, very fast. Right. And he said he had a great two handed set shot. And the second that the jump shot came out, he was done because he just got blocked all the time. Right. And he talked about his family. He has a sister. His father was a pharmacist who they called Doc. Um, and every, he was so wonderful. And everybody came to him for it, problems, medical problems. He said he didn't care much about money, about making money. He, and, quote, much to the chagrin of my mother and sister. He said, <laughs> he said, we were the last people on the block to get a television set. But I said, what was your favorite show? He said, The Honeymooners. Oh, that's pretty much everybody's favorite first show, if they can. And I recommend it to Gen, Gen Z. They have to see The Honeymooners because I think they will laugh at it. I think people will find that funny. It, there is a universal humor to the scene where uh, Ralph and Norton are carrying a, a bureau. And, uh, and Norton says... Uh, I got an idea, you know, whenever I can't do a norm. And he says, I have an idea how, how to make it. Let's take the drawers out. And Ralph says, great idea. So they take the drawers out, put it on top of the bureau. <laughs> <laughs> now if, if people don't know, that's Jackie Gleason and Art Carney. And it's one of the first, most amazing. It was almost like Death of a Salesman. It had its own... They were dreamers, you know. They were uh, uh, Art Carney's character worked in the sewer. It worked in the sewers as a hardworking man, mm -hmm. and Jackie Gleason's character, Ralph Cramden, drove a bus. And there's an every man thing about it, and I think that's what things like King of Queens, different kinds of shows that had working people, hardworking people uh, represented. It was so amazing because there was always an American dream behind the show. And he would always have a, a pipe dream. We're going to make it. We're going to make it, yeah. Alice. We're going to get out. And I'm going to get out of the sewer, you know. And, and they were always hoping for that brighter day. And I think it makes me, th I have been thinking about the honeymooners because of what we've all been going through and what the working family has gone through, which is not being able to work. Mm -hmm. And now things are coming back. Um, and I actually wanted to get you back before we found out about Fauci's uh, height and family history, and I just digressed, you were talking about uh, 70% was more right. than they expected of Moderna. And I, and I'll, uh, but I, now I have to digress because we're Please. getting right That's why I love this. And, and say that the honeymooners, um, so 
one of my early moments of chagrin um, was we were at the graduation. It was a private school somewhere up in Westchester. Um, you're hearing the phone from, I didn't hit do not disturb, but anyway. <laughs> um, and my cousin was graduating from someplace and uh, it was outdoors and there was Art Carney because I guess his son was graduating. And my grandmother, we called her Nanny. Um, she, uh, Lenore Eisenbud, would uh, went up to him and said, because we didn't have the courage, but she goes up to him and says, how does it feel to be out of the sewer? Oh, my. Oh, my. Wow. And <laughs> we hid behind the chairs. <laughs> it was... It is when someone identifies only with your character and the man worked in a sewer. (laughs) How does it feel to be out of the sewer? Um, (laughs) But anyway, so the thing about, so we were hoping for, you know, 70%, Tony was saying 70% uh, protection would be great. So in comes the results, 95% protection, 94%, 95% um, against uh, getting sick. And, uh, and in the studies, which were a total of 74,000 people, as we said, nobody died and nobody was in the hospital. So, and, so um, why didn't, you know, I'm sure that was released. I'm sure people found out that information. Yeah. But I think so many people that are hesitant, and I, I got to be honest with you, I just got tested. I'm doing a TV show tomorrow. I just got tested here at the house. And the nurse practitioner that came here told me she has not had the vaccine. And I said, well, but you're around people. Why have you not? And, and she said, you know, I just I just haven't, but I should. Um, and I think that's also a, a certain amount of people that just, that it's not high on their list, or maybe there is a little bit of fear because they hear you don't feel well after the second <laughs> shot. Mm-hmm. But, but what's interesting to me is it's not all this political rebellion when I talk to people. Some people, they also know now, I'm all over the place, but that's me, that they are they are able and correct me if I'm wrong with different drugs to help people more now than they could in the very beginning where you ended up on a ventilator quickly is that accurate we know more we know that steroids can help and some other remdesivir can help but 570,000 people have died yeah and uh you know we're still having many hundreds of deaths a day uh around the world uh, you see what's happening in India. It's a tragedy over there. They Remember we talked about bending the curve? We wanted to bend the curve so that we didn't have the spike of cases that would collapse the healthcare system. Well, it collapsed in India. And a journalist live tweeted as his oxygen level dropped and dropped and dropped until he died. So they're, ha- they're having people dying because they don't have enough oxygen. And this and is- And that's on the upswing there right now, right? They have it, not hit- the it's peak yet, it a little bit. Actually, I saw a little glitch where it looked like it might be turning down. But no, they're there. If you look at the seven day averages, they're still in huge trouble. Oh. Um, and, and this gets to so, you know, super serious part of the, the conversation, which is. There are a lot of reasons to care about the rest of the world. Um, this is a moment where. We have to look at our common humanity and say, um, you know, we're, we are, you know, you've heard it over and over again, we're all in this together. Right. Um, and the, the pandemic's not going to be over for every, for anyone. The pandemic's not going to be over for anyone until it's over for everyone. Mm-hmm. Because we are, we live in this very small globe. Uh, if there are a ton of cases across the globe, even if you don't, you know, if you, even if you don't altruistically care about them, which you should, uh, it's still selfishly going to come back and boomerang on you because, There'll be variants because of all the different mutations that can happen. There may be a variant that eventually becomes right now so far so good that the vaccines are are doing a pretty good job at handling the variants, but there may be one that develops that it doesn't handle so handle so well. And then it's going to come back because you can't keep viruses. Viruses don't know from uh, borders of countries. It'll, it'll come back here and get us. So the best thing we can do selfishly is to help the rest of the world here. Um, and I was, I'm glad to see that we are shipping uh, uh, supplies and, and vaccines to the rest of the world. We have to do more of that. And I tone Tony, Fau- Tony Fauci and others are involved in this effort. But um, are, are we sending more out also because not everyone is utilizing them and there's a time well, to stamp on them? Yeah. The, expiration. Um, I don't know so much the expiration, but uh, I know AstraZeneca 
So we're not, we're not, that's not authorized the United States. So they're sending, we have some, so we're sending millions, I believe. I thought that was a Brad Pitt movie until I realized what it was. It was, <laughs> it is the vaccine that came out of Europe. It came out of uh, <laughs> it's Oxford, um, Oxford AstraZeneca. Right. Um, these are all. Do you uh, like that one? Is that what is that? You know, I, I, I think they're all amazing. It's, it's an embarrassment of riches because, you know, we have one that's 95% with the Moderna and Pfizer. Um, you know, Johnson and Johnson was actually 85% effective at severe at preventing severe illness, but their press release originally kind of, I, I buried the lead. They, yeah, they it was like in the 60%. It was in the 60s and 70s because they were saying protecting against, against moderate to severe. But what you care about the most is severe. Are you going to die or end up in the hospital? So they kind of buried the lead on their own press release on that. And AstraZeneca has had some clotting issues, but again, very rarely. Um, with with the clotting and the low platelet count. So um, when you look at the risk benefit, uh, you're going to save, and which they did in the modeling studies that they talked about at the NI, you know, at this this meeting that I talked about with the to the the advisory committee to the CDC, when they were talking about the J and J vaccine, they said yes, it can happen very very rarely, but when you look at a model that says how many lives are saved, there's no doubt that the benefits of getting vaccinated far outweigh, outweigh the risks. Um, so these I'm, vaccines, I'm worried right now about if you're the person who gets the side effect, you say, why did I do it? Because if you're the one in a million, it's 100 percent, even if it's one in a million. For the yeah, population. exactly. And I think that's the fear that people have. And that's why I wanted to talk to you about this, because I also I want people to w believe that the, the vaccine works and that and that science works. And but I understand people that are hesitant because of what we've gone through as a human race and what we've gone through in this country and are going through. And the separation is something that is so painful for me because I, I do care about everybody. And I know so many people, I've been outperforming. So I've been out in a room with, which would normally have 7,000 people in Atlantic City and they had 1,000 people. And I would say about maybe 30% were vaccinated which is a lot and probably about half that audience and i would ask audiences we're not going to get vaccinated mm -hmm. and i'm not putting my stuff down people's throat um that's a different subject that's a that's yeah. pfizer and that's a different product they make but <laughs> wow my wife's gonna like that one but um how can i help people or how can we put it into plain speak that doesn't push people away. That's your job every day, right? Yeah. Is to so, somehow get it yeah. out there in human terms to educate and make them believe a lady, in, uh, a, a wonderful mom in Kansas watches CBS News, watches 60 Minutes, and says to her kid or her, her brother, you know, I watched this thing, and Dr. John LaPook said this, if, if maybe we should think about it. Those are the people that I'm hoping can understand that, because I truly believe in this. So um, a couple of things. First of all, I want to get into that discussion about vaccine hesitancy, because it's it's a topic I've been very concerned about for years. Remember the measles, MMR, there was a whole vaccine hesitancy about that. And I actually did a, a big piece on it for CBS Sunday Morning, where I looked at, you know, how do you, how do you talk to people? And more importantly than talking to people, how do you listen to people who have vaccine hesitancy? But first, a question. In your audience, were they wearing masks? They came in with masks because that's the policy of the place. It was the Hard Rock in Atlantic City. They wore them when they had their beverages because people drink when I work in order to get through my work. They uh, would take <laughs> the masks off. And then I would say most people would leave them off. Um, yeah. and and have the drink whether they were using it or not because it's not comfortable and but they were very distanced from other people but still you know i saw the movie outbreak and i saw a phlegm ball point of view going in a movie theater coming out of one guy's mouth when he was laughing and then circle around and go into another person's mouth and i went oh that's how this is transmuted so yeah and it's and it's too bad that that the public health message during the pandemic got politicized so much, because something as simple as wearing a mask, it should be a no brainer. Yes, it's true that at the beginning of the pandemic, um, the public health people, including Tony Fauci, uh, said, 
you don't have to wear a mask uh, out in public. And that was for a bunch of reasons, uh, including that there was a fear of a shortage of masks for health professionals who really needed them. Um, but also, we didn't we didn't know if they really worked. There wasn't this is, a lot. Of- this is March 2020 kind of thinking, March right? 2020. Right. And uh, and but most importantly, we didn't realize yet that people could spread it, and in fact, fifty percent or more spread it without having symptoms. So once you're spreading it without having symptoms, you can't rely on t- telling people if you feel badly, just stay home, and then that way you won't spread it. So that was a game changer. By the beginning of April, Bob, by the beginning of April, Tony Fauci and the CDC and everybody else was saying wear a mask. And yet it became politicized. And, you know, there's logic and then there's belief. And, you know, I tried every possible logical argument and even emotional argument uh, that I, I, on, on air, including one that I thought was pretty good, which was imagine it's World War II, it's the Blitzkrieg in London. And, you know, the Nazis are bombing London and everybody has the blackout shades, right? Mm-hmm. And somebody says, "Yeah, it's my it's my right. I'm not going to black out my my shades. I'm going to leave my lights on." Well, they might not get bombed, but the neighbor might get bombed. Right. And that's exactly what happens when you decide not to wear a mask. If you're infected, you may end up being fine. You know, you may be one of the lucky ones, but you could infect somebody with a compromised immune system, somebody who couldn't get vaccinated. Um, and so you we you know we have to think about each other, and it's a time. <laughs> You know, it's time we, we have to do that. And some people resist that uh, argument. It's not an argument. Uh, it's very, you know, the Beatles, all you need is love, is something that in this moment people are cynical about it. Yeah, right, sure. But the truth of it is I think people are basically good. And I have talked to people that are, I'm not doing that. I'm not wearing that. That's my right. And yet if you really talk to them, and I think really could explain it to them, I think they would go, well, you can wear one. But I do think you could get empathy out of people aren't as evil as the people on social media that are attacking everyone. You know, it's not, it might be millions of people, but it's not 300 million people, you know? Yeah, empathy is the word. And of course, it's a big word for me. I started something called the Empathy Project at NYU Langone Health. Yes, you did. Hollywood quality short films to try to teach clinicians in training and clinicians to be more empathetic and sensitive and competent, and then to empower patients to demand it. And I think we need empathy throughout. It's not just medicine. It's no. throughout every walk of life. And it's I think humanity. Empathy, yeah. Humanity. And, um, and, and all, but, all life, all, you know, it, it encompasses everything. And I do want to ask something that is just accolades. You, did, is that what you got two Emmys for and the Edward um, R. Murrow Award? At all the, yeah, at, um, <clears throat> we, n- no. Um, so I got, I got three Emmys for some pieces that we did. Um, the one that I'm, you know, we did the Boston Marathon, uh, uh, special reports on that. Uh, we yes. had a best, we had a best show. I was part of the best show for um, CBS Sunday morning. Our show, our piece was on Gilda Radner. And, uh, oh my God. And uh, I interviewed Zweibel for that. I love him. And And she was, I mean, there was, Norman was just, Norman the other night was talking about when he hosted Saturday Night Live. He just, he loved Gilda Radner so much. We all did. Gilda Radner was great. We all did. And the, um, anyway, that was, that was a really great, but the one I was really most proud of was we did a piece where there was a shortage of, I, I found out through a friend of mine who was a doctor, that there's a shortage of chemotherapy. This was back in 2012, I think. There was a shortage of chemotherapy drugs for, uh, in general, but also for babies. And there was a law, uh, a bill pending in Congress that apparently everybody wanted to pass that would help fix it by lots of things, you know, bringing it in from abroad and opening up various technical channels and et cetera, et cetera. Everybody agreed. The House wanted it. The Senate wanted it, president wanted it, and it was sitting for like 15 months not getting passed. And so I pitched this piece, Dr. LaPoot goes to Washington. <laughs> and <laughs> I went down there and I spoke to a bunch of people. And anyway, we, we ended up, um, you know, Harry Reid at the very end. I was one of the people at the, in, at, you know, 
to, for, for uh, Boehner, when Boehner was having his conference, his uh, raising my hand saying, why aren't, you know, why aren't you? And he said, right. well, talk to the leadership. And I said, I talked to the leadership. Anyway, I ended up speaking to Harry Reid and uh, saying, why does it take so long? He said, you know, it's been that way for a hundred and however many years and nobody can explain it. <laughs> so the piece ended. And then uh, like a week or two later, they passed it. And several months later, the number of um, the shortage came down dramatically. Uh, so that is the power of the media the when it works, and when this, it works. And we, we, we profiled a little baby who, who was not able to get her chemotherapy. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to, to say, you know, this is, you know, this is really important for reasons A, B, and C. It's another thing to, to say, here's a baby. And in fact, when I pitched it originally to CBS, um, they did finally okay it, but I actually had to pitch it three times because um, there was a lot of other stuff going on. And, you know, maybe I wasn't doing a good job with the pitch. But on the third pitch, I said, we're talking about babies with cancer. <laughs> babies with cancer. And they said, okay, 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 go down. And then I, I heard that when I left the room, somebody said, listen, if it's no good, we'll just, we just won't put it on the air. Because <laughs> like I had never done a political piece. Right. I mean, this was the only time I ever did a, I mean, you know, I, and the, so. Um, but it's not political. I mean, at all. It was a health piece, but I had, you know, talking to, you know, talking to these senators and congressmen. And right. That, 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 that and is Rooney, right. Um, you know, it was, it was really interesting. And then of course, then I had gone in 2009, I interviewed President Obama in the Blue Room uh, about the Affordable Care Act. So that was really, that was really exciting. And but, you also, I want to talk, I have so much I want to talk to you about. I know you probably have plans, but we'll be right back. All right. I want to make clear that what you're about to listen to is a paid sponsor brought to you by BetterHelp. But it is something that I actually believe deeply in, which is people taking care of their mental health. Throughout my life, I've known a lot of people that have had issues and problems and could have been helped. And better help. I know you've heard a lot of ads for them. I hear them all the time. And I really appreciate them because not a lot of people understand therapy or understand getting help for their mental health, being able to talk to people. And this is a service that exists, and it's real. And uh, I have questions to ask you. Does something interfere with your happiness? Because a lot of people would say yes. Is something preventing you from achieving your goals? A lot of people would say yes to that. I've always had something that kept me from achieving my goals. Better help will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can connect in a safe and private online environment. It's so convenient. You can start communicating in under 48 hours. This is not a crisis line. It's not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. Send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all without ever having to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room during these times where you might want to not go anywhere. It's more affordable than traditional offline counseling and financial aid is available. The service is available for clients worldwide. Find the particular expertise you need online. Don't limit yourself to the counselors located near you. Licensed professional counselors are specialized in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflicts, LGBT matters, grief, self-esteem, Anything you share is confidential. It's convenient, professional, affordable, and check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. This is not a crisis line. In fact, so many people have been using better help that they are recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I would like you to start living a happier life today. And as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting BetterHelp at betterhelp.com slash bob. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Bob. Okay, we're back. See, this is the beauty of podcasts. It's so... Wow. Right? And and I don't think we had a pharmaceutical sponsor. I'm pretty sure we did not just now. It was probably about mental health or something you can do to shave yourself to look good. <laughs> you... Also, and I want to, I really do want to talk more about our situation with COVID and, and that I think a lot of people appreciate everything that you've been doing. Because before I got to know you better, um, 
it's been recent kind of that we've talked more because of the Zooms and Norman. Um, it's you, you're one of my go-tos now. So you joined CBS in 2006. Is that correct? 2006. It was March of 2006. And you were had a practice. Yeah. Gastrointestinal. And I, had, I, had, and I had been, you know, like a talking head every now and then uh, on, you know, Good Morning America or on the Today Show, which is where I met Katie. Um, and um, and then I ended up, you know, her, her husband, Jay, got sick with colon cancer. And I, I wasn't his doctor, but I helped her sort of, you know, giving some advice. So we, we became close. Uh, and then in 2006, I get a phone call from Katie. Now, she had just been uh, announced, they had just announced that she was going to be the first female solo anchor of an evening broadcast. Mm -hmm. And so she called me up and said, uh, I have a business proposition for you. I said, what? She said, how would you like to be the medical correspondent for CBS News? I said, do you have to know anything? She said, no. I said, great. <laughs> <laughs> you def These days, you don't have to know anything, in, said, not great. at CBS, but in, in some organizations. But, but Bob, the, the thing was, that the, now it'll, <laughs> it'll be it'll, the truth will come out here for the first time, that they actually didn't really do their homework at CBS. They thought that I had been a correspondent and I knew how to read the teleprompter and I knew I knew how to write a script and I knew because how to Because you talk. were savvy on camera, they assumed. I was just having a conversation, which is different than reading a teleprompter or writing a script or reading a script. You mm -hmm. know that. And sounding like yourself. Right. Sound like yourself. I am. <laughs> like, I can't help it. Yourself. You know. Um, so I get up there the first day and I actually was there a little bit before Katie. Um, and so I think it was Katie like Kirk, by the way, if Katie anyone Kirk. has any doubts, Katie Kirk, um, you know, it's amazing. Go plan a life. Like when I was in medical school, I thought, you know, some, someday I'm going to be the chief medical correspondent for CBS news <laughs> pieces for 60 minutes, but, and be talking to Bob Saget. Um, yeah, I'm, um, I'm one of your dreams. I know <laughs> it's a dream. It's a dream. Um, I just wish you were my doctor. Um, good use of the subjunctive. <laughs> Excellent. Um, I, uh, I'm on there. First time I'm on, it's, it's, um, Bob Schieffer. It's in August. I think it was, I think it was in August. Uh, could have been September. Uh, first time I'm on and they, I'm going to talk about this new medication that's out. And, uh, they said, read the teleprompter. And after you read the teleprompter, turn to Bob and you'll have a little talk about it. And Mike Somson was the producer. I remember and uh, so he's standing by there and they go three, two, one. And I go, one of the most interesting new products available. No Stop. <laughs> John, have you ever read a teleprompter before? <laughs> no. <laughs> so they ended up sending me to this fabulous woman, Priscilla Shanks. And she is like the Henry Higgins of broadcast. The rain in Spain. Right? right. Most people are with her for like, you know, six months. I was with her for like two years. You know, it's, you know how to sound like yourself. How right. to, how to, and and a lot of it was very uh, Yoda. Like it was, it was looking looking at last night's broadcasting and say and having her say, you don't hit the word and and you know, people are people are listening and even not watching. The words matter. Which words you hit have have the thing that's most important at the end of the sentence lots of things like that but then it becomes and i know from my all my teleprompter experiences i learned it becomes your it's just a tool it's almost like your your notes even if you're reading it word perfect it's still you're able to take a pause and the teleprompter yeah. person and you become symbiotic and the, they <laughs> wait for you and you and you can take off roads yeah what i love about what you do what the best people are able to do to impart medical information is to just be speaking to people and, and it's broadcasting, but you know, you watch these TV doctors and they have shows and they're famous and we know who they are. And I don't go to them for my medical advice. Once in a while I'll watch it or I'll hear them talk, but the ones with the shows that are syndicated or network or, or daytime shows where they're a TV star, I mean, I'm not going to ask you how you regard them because they're helping people in a different way. Mm -hmm. They're doing it for the home audience. Do you find a lot of misinformation out there because of this kind of broadcasting? 
You know, I, I think the misinformation is really on the internet where anybody can tweet with, with somebody has three followers and their tweet looks this, as the same font as somebody with three million who's had a huge education and is well regarded. I that's mean, where we're at. That that's is where we're at. everybody's got a voice. We wanted to say, isn't this great? The internet that everybody has a voice. And now it's like, maybe everybody shouldn't have a voice or the same, you know, if you're, if there should be some sort of weighting, by the way, this comes from somebody who has a PhD in electrical engineering, and he's talking about electrical engineering, you know, a, a good housekeeping. Uh, I don't, I don't know what, I don't have the answer for the internet, believe me. But well, um, it's kind of become, there was a South park years ago, South park, which represents satire, which a lot of people don't know what satire is now either. But it would be like, here's the leader of the free world in a split screen with, and it was inappropriate what they said, but it was basically a little person in a bikini mm -hmm. and they have equal time yeah. and both of their viewpoints have equal time. And that is, yes, everyone should have a right to their opinion, but do you give them equal time on the news? And people, you know, all of our cable news services, they put on things that serve their yeah. product. So this gets to something I take enormously seriously, which is I'm speaking to millions of people. You can't unsay something to millions of people. So you really have to think about what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And I know it's maybe a minute and 20 seconds on the evening news. I've spent the whole day working on it and speaking. <clears throat> I, get, I may find out about a story in the morning or even in the afternoon, or maybe an hour before the broadcast. And I do research, I, I go to databases. Fortunately, one of the great things, it's a great being high on the learning curve. That's what you always want, right? You know, being right. high on the learning curve. I pick up the phone, anybody will pick up the phone, everybody answers. You know, I can call Tony Fauci, I can call Francis Collins, I can call the head of the, the CDC. Um, and uh, I just spoke to Rochelle Walensky a couple of days ago. I, I met her for the first time. We knew of each other, but we hadn't spoken and I was super impressed. Mm. With her. So, um, and then they, you know, they bring me up and then I speak to uh, the world's expert and whatever it is. And suddenly I'm at 88% of what I need to know in order to really talk about it. You know, having started out the day, maybe at 30% because of just my knowledge as a physician and a professor of medicine. So it's amazing. I can learn all this stuff, but then I go on TV and I am sweating every single word I'm saying. It's, it really matters. Mm -hmm. um, and well, this is why uh, I, you're so great, John. This is so important that you're imparting information. You're the conduit. You're the oh. you are the messenger of all the first thing you can you can put all the information into your mind and out through your mouth from these experts and not misrepresent what they said. Yeah. And then get the jewels out to the people. I think I think it's important to have uh, humility throughout it all and realize, you know, we have a research department. They've saved me more times than I can tell you. The head of it is Debbie Rubin, who is, you know, without her, there's no CBS news. And then she has many times said, well, wait a second, wait a second. You just said two plus two is five. Do you want to rethink that? You know, mm -hmm. so people don't realize the amazing support system that there is behind that. But I will tell you um, very early on in, um, and here's a story I haven't, I haven't really told. Um, very early on, I went on the air. It was like 2007 or eight. It was, it was, it was or maybe earlier. And I, it, I was reading a teleprompter about, about the flu vaccine, when you give the flu vaccine to kids and how many doses. And as I'm reading it, I'm saying to myself, that doesn't sound right. But I read it. And um, it turned out it was wrong. I, we had implied that you should give the vaccine twice to kids. It's actually not true at all. Maybe, maybe in you know the very, very first time you need to do it, but basically it's once a year, like you would think. Right. I had implied that going on in childhood, it was twice a year, which was wrong. And I went up to the, uh, I realized it right away. I went up to our producer. I said, we would have to make a correction on tomorrow's news. She said, no, we, we'll put it on the web. I said, we, I just said it to 7 million people. I'm gonna, I'm gonna unsay it to 200,000 who are on the web. And she right. said, that's the way it is. I go home. I am stewing on this. You're right. I'm stewing on this. And by the, you know, and by the next morning I am in a state, 
I, yeah. I had patients in the morning. I walk over on the way over from uh, my medical office to 57th and 10th. I'm doing the scene basically from um, a, a Groucho Marx movie, which is the one where he plays the head of a nation and they've been at war with another oh, nation. Oh, oh, for, for, is it Pretonia, right? Or yeah, for, for like 500 years. Duck soup or I don't know, whatever, whatever it was. Boy, and, am I, I, this is where you needed me and I left you hanging. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so he's, the, he's so whoever whoever plays the, the leader, I don't know if it was Groucho, may, may have been Groucho. It was, saying, it, yeah. It was Groucho. He says, I can't believe it after 500 years, you know, we're finally going to be uh, at peace. He's going to walk in and I'm going to put my hand out and we're going to shake hands. But wait a second, what if I put my hand out to shake my hands and he doesn't take my hand? Well, that's a fine, how do you do? Here I am putting out my hands. And, and so he walks, uh, the guy walks through the door and says, Conrad, you won't shake my hand? It's war, you know, so he has completely worked. That is what I did. So by the time I'm at. It's the old Jack Jack story. The guy's not going to lend you the Jack. You knock on the door and you curse at the guy for not giving you the Jack. So 7th Avenue, um, I walk over from 5th Avenue. By 7th Avenue, I'm calling Kate, my wife. And I said, how would you feel if I were to quit CBS today? And she knew I was thinking, but she said, I'm with you. I'm back. I back you up 100%. I love so this. So I get into the broadcast center and I said to Rick Kaplan, who is a legendary executive producer, he mm-hmm. has uh, won 50 some odd <laughs> Emmys and bigger than life guy. And I said, uh, and I'm ready to quit. And I said, I have to uh, do a correction tonight of because, and I explained that yesterday, you know, we said, we implied that that a baby had to have more than one vaccine. He goes, what's the worst thing that can happen? I said, a baby will die because right. a woman, a mother will not give her baby the vaccine because they don't want to give two. And they figured the heck of it. I'm, I'm not going to. And then the baby gets the flu and dies. He turns to Chris Dynan, who's now at ABC. But he says, Chris, we're doing a correction tonight. It took him the compile in his brain took anywhere from three to four seconds. And that's the and, that's where we should all be at. I mean, that's right. why for for me, CBS News. For you, know, not to do an ad for CBS News, but you know, Edward R. Murrow, you know, Walter Cronkite. Walter Cronkite they, that, was the guy that told me that memory matters. Mm-hmm. And um, people like Susan Zarinsky, who's who's now the president, but she's going to be segue into a different role. But it's always been that they understand. For me, the Hippocratic Oath always trumps the Nielsen ratings. Always. Yeah. And the fact that it took, the fact that I had a safety net made it so that I was fine and I've been fine ever since. And anytime there's been a choice between I have a sick patient and I've got to, I can't do it. I got to, you know, I got to talk or be with a sick patient. There's never been a question that the priority is. Must do the news. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> must do must do medicine. And to yeah. me, have you ever in an emergency situation brought the sick patient to your broadcast so you could do both? <laughs> Sorry, that's my, have, my, I, my gallows humor. Sorry. I, I will tell you that um, I have t- I t- I've taken care of a lot of people at CBS um, that I never say who they are. Uh, I, I don't they don't th- nobody knows that the other one is just to ask me something uh, every day I get asked. I get several phone calls and I see many people at CBS. And, and then my office actually has a, when we were there, has blinds, it has a lock and I have my medical bag there. And I have, yes, I have seen people there who were sick. So did you ever uh, prescribe a uh, Lipitor to Stephen Colbert? <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke. I'm sorry. I, he and I, I have a, we, we, we look similar. So I assume he's on Lipitor like I am for cholesterol. It's good, good logic. I'm glad <laughs> you're not the surgeon general. <laughs> I'm really glad I have nothing to do with your profession, but, but we, we, go ahead. No, there's so much that I, I we just, should talk about that. We should talk about the vaccine hesitancy because that, I, that is, that is what I want to talk about. Yeah. And so let's talk about vaccine hesitancy because <sighs> I think when you talk about empathy, that's where it has to come in. And the big mistake that you make, because this is not just going on for this, there's been vaccine hesitancy since 
since as long as there have been vaccines. Yeah, you there know, are back- people that don't, didn't take the polio vaccine. There are people that don't get a flu shot. I mean, I am deficient sometimes. Bob, there, and the flu vaccine is nowhere near as effective as the vaccines against SARS-CoV-2, the right. virus that causes COVID-19. The Back in the age, Benjamin Franklin went to his death regretting that he never gave a sort of a new form of the smallpox vaccine to his son who died at age, I think it was about three, and because he, he figured it was just too new. Um, whenever, when it's not a new thing, whenever, as long as there have been vaccines, there have been people who have been hesitant. There's been a lot of misinformation I'm not going to even get into having to do with the MMR. Um, but when we did a CBS Sunday morning piece about vaccine hesitancy several years ago, I actually went around the country and I talked to people who were hesitant and talked to people, uh, who were actually also dealing with how you, what you do about that. There was a, uh, it ranges from people who are liberty, you know, you, you're not going to tell me what to do. Right. You know, um, don't tell me what to do to. And I understand that, by the way. And I, I understand that. You, right. You have to understand all of it to people mm-hmm. who are um, sort of uh, green. You know, this is not green. It's not natural. So mm-hmm. I'm not going to put it in my body. Right. Well, penicillin's not natural either, you know, and, you know, our life expectancy was, uh, a lot less a hundred years ago before a lot of these medicines and vaccines, aside from clean water, there's been nothing that's been more helpful for human health than vaccines. I think that's, that's safe to say. So when you're talking to people, first of all, again, I say talking to people, it has to be when you are listening to people Mm -hmm. who are vaccine hesitant, let's play, let's role play. You're vaccine hesitant. Um, And you just said, I'm, I'm not going to take the vaccine. And I would say, why are you not going to take the vaccine? And I, I would say because I don't trust something that hasn't been proven. And I also have my brother. I think I had COVID. That's what people say. And I, I recovered from it. And so they don't know, you know whether they had their uh, antibodies checked. But I just believe that I don't, I don't need it because I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm not going to die. Right. And, and just, just to be just to be clear for anybody just tuning in, he's role playing. I'm role yeah, playing. That's Oregon correct. Has been vaccinated. Right. So this is not Bob but, talking to Dr. LaPook. Right. But but um, and it's always dangerous. Right. People take this out of uh, they lift it out. Of, oh, they, say, they will lift this totally. And right. that'll, so, be the sound bite. that'll be the soundbite. I sound I bite. don't believe in your theories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but um, I think so. You're listening to that specific complaint. Right. And then you address that specific complaint. So if you're saying. Uh, I, I literally one by one, every piece of it, I would talk about, you said, I think I got it and I think I recovered. And right. then I would go over the statistics, 570 million, uh, sorry, 570,000 Americans have died. I talk about the mortality rate, which is a lot higher than the flu. Mm-hmm. Um, I would talk about uh, the responsibility, not just for you, but for your neighbors. So there are 11 million people in America who are immunosuppressed. They're, they have, they're, for various reasons, they're taking medicines that suppress their immune system because they have autoimmune disease or they have organ transplants. So about 630,000 people or so have like heart transplants, kidney transplants. They're on medicines that make it um, so that it's less likely that the vaccine is gonna be effective for them. We actually are doing the piece now, you're hearing it here first. Uh, but it'll be on CBS this morning soon. Um, so that's, there's that. And then so they cannot they they cannot take the vaccine. They can take the vaccine. It's not going to hurt them. It's not dangerous. But okay. their immune system, because the medicine they're on, suppress the immune system. Because remember, the medicines are to stop your body from rejecting the organ that's been mm-hmm. transplanted. It's a foreign object coming from another person. Right. So you suppress your own immune system. Well, that same drug that suppresses your immune system suppresses the ability of your immune system to react to the vaccine. So, and they're finding that some people react okay, and some people don't have as good of a of a react. They don't make as good of an antibody or immune response. So that's the people with solid organs. But then there are people with solid, solid organ transplant. Then there are people who have like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus conditions where or you're been taking- apt to get pneumonia. People because it is a, a you know pulmonary 
problems uh, are well, often the death cause from yes, this disease? Yes, but what I'm going to getting at is different than that. What I'm saying is that because they have diseases where, and it's often women more than men, where their immune systems are revved up mm -hmm. and, and they're attacking their own joints. They're attacking their own lining of their lungs. They're attacking their, their own body. They're called auto self immune, autoimmune diseases. Yes. So you're, you're, your immune system makes a mistake and it starts attacking itself. It, it thinks that its own body is the enemy right. and it turns on itself. And in fact, that's what happens in, you know, in, this, in the second week of COVID. What happened the first week is the replication of the virus. The second week, which is so dangerous, is that your immune system gets so over exuberant that it starts damaging yourself. Um, and that's so anyway, these people, there are 11 million people the 630,000 or so who have gotten organ transplant, and the rest who have lupus or rheumatoid arthritis or- I had a sister diseases. with scleroderma. Scleroderma. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they're on medicines that damp down your immune system. We don't know yet how effective the vaccines are in them because they were excluded from the immune, from the vaccine trials. Right. For good reason, because you know it was really a variable you, that we now, we really do have to address. But the reason why I'm saying all of that is that if you think you may want to roll the dice for yourself, but when you are rolling the dice for yourself, it's not just rolling the dice for yourself. You're rolling the dice for people around you, for the elderly person who just didn't get around to getting vaccinated, for the immunosuppressed person mm -hmm. because of medication or their underlying condition who is not protected and is relying on herd immunity, herd immunity, like the herd of like, you know, sheep. I and mean, the, the idea is that the, you can have a weak sheep in the middle of a herd and the wolves or whatever, the attackers can't get to it if it's the middle of a protective herd. So I you personally have, always resent that I'm called part of a herd because I don't want to be branded or live in a, you know, just out in the field. No, you're a unique. I'm a two-legged creature. You, you are. <laughs> you And you're not part of a herd. Um, don't you hate it when people say um, he he's really unique? He's very unique. You're either I, unique or you're not unique. That's you're a nice way unique. of saying something's wrong with Bob. You're never, no, you, you are, you, yeah, you're different. I'm different. <laughs> like from this chorus line, that song, right? <laughs> exactly. Anyone who is different. Um, so anyway, there are other reasons aside from yourself to be your responsibility to society. Now, is that something that resonates, you know, with the person? Maybe I think it does. it does. I think it does when it comes to the elderly. I think that hit home. And, and of course, it got politicized as well. But the fact is that when an elderly person gets it and they lose someone, when, when someone loses their parent or someone they loved, it can't help but make them think they want to blame other people. But a lot of people are just good people that lost someone that they loved. And, yes. that, if, and that may sway them too late. Uh, well, what you're getting at is, you know, a lot of people, especially at the beginning, didn't know anybody who had it. That was the hoax thing. This is a hoax until they're in the ICU saying, I guess it's not a hoax. But, you know, the civil liber liberties people, the people say, this is my right. The way you get control back over, this would be another argument that I would say, mm -hmm. is the way you get control back over your own life is by getting vaccinated because we're a heterogeneous country. And guess what? SARS-CoV-2 is going to be around for a long time. It's probably going to be what's called endemic, meaning it's it's here, it's low level, not enough to cause the kind of problem it's been causing, but it probably would be hard to really eradicate it, even with vaccination. You know, it took decades to eradicate smallpox. And that was a huge global effort. So, And a lot of people don't want to hear about smallpox. They don't want to hear about past diseases. Well, yeah, they, they don't they, want they to have, see the graph on disease they, and humanity. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's how this is what I'm trying to do is bring it down to you and your own self sense of control. So you have a country where you're going to see little pockets of outbreaks for, for a while. Probably in the fall, we'll see some more outbreaks here and there. If you, and, and you, I'm sorry to interrupt, but you know, people are sick of that. They are so tired of hearing, well, you know, that's going to happen again. There's going to be a surge. And know, they're like, here, I just want to live my damn life is what okay, people are saying. So Even I feel that. I'm so glad that you're saying that because this is exactly the, the, the role playing I wanted to hear. So you, I'm sick and tired of hearing that. But here, and, here it and is. people are. I mean, I'm sure you are as well. You would love to be able to just sit yes. and Bob but, come over. And well, you don't want me to come over, but and here's how here's how here's how you make it into a self-serving argument. Like I would say to that person, 
because it's going to be popping up all over the country, you're not going to be able to do anything about that. But you can create a bubble, a relative bubble in your own, expand the bubble from your own house to your neighborhood, to your small town. Mm -hmm. If everybody in your small town gets vaccinated or, or a large proportion does, your small town can start to get back to normal. You can start doing stuff in your, and then keep expanding that. Have it be that everybody's responsible for their own town. And the smaller you can get, the more granular you can get, I think the more successful. This has to be from the bottom up. It's not going to be, so what we've found, you know, what they've found, the big they in research. Mm -hmm. Yes, it helps to have the head of the NIH, Francis Collins, wonderful man saying, get vaccinated. Tony Fauci, get vaccinated. Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, get vaccinated. And some people don't want to hear from any of them. A lot of people don't want to. So now you have to, I went out to Minneapolis and I went to a church and I spoke to a pastor who was giving the message from the pulpit virtually. Mm. And he was saying, get vaccinated. And I said to him at one point, I said, they may not listen to the head of the NIH, but they're going to listen to their pastor. He said, yep, yeah. they're going to listen to their pastor. So we have to go into the communities, faith-based communities, community centers. We have to go to trusted people around the country. I saw a wonderful sort of, uh, PSA type thing that Shaquille O'Neal and Charles Barkley and President Obama did talking about getting vaccinated. I think that people who are well known should make PSAs. They're little mini PSAs and put them right. up on, on, you know, and make it clear. And and uh, I saw John Legend on CBS this morning, mm -hmm. uh, just yesterday, uh, was on talking about how important it was to get vaccinated. You know what he said was that he's talking to Gail King, the fabulous Gail King, who is yeah. so great. Um, and too, it was with uh, Anthony Mason and, and Tony DeCopel. They're, they're amazing together. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about, you want to go back to see me in a, in, a, in concert? Get vaccinated. Right. And get it is going to get, do you think we're going to get to the point where you have to have your vaccination card in order to get into England? Are they going to be doing yeah. that? You know, I, I think it's, it's being done certainly in areas, you know, the vaccine passport right. obviously can get, there are workarounds, you know. I mean, yeah. you can make a counterfeit $20 bill. You can, yeah, make you can get kids, get fake IDs. You can get your account, fake <laughs> counterfeit ID. I would, I, I actually am recommending to people. I told one of my good friends who, who uh, posted his vaccine card. Don't do that. You're just giving people the lot number of something that they can counterfeit. Right. So um, I would, I would suggest not doing that. Um, but I got to interrupt you because I want to ask about 21 year olds. I was hearing something legislative wise is that accurate that they're not requiring that age group to get vaccinated? Is, was there something that I, and this is how all of this crap gets spread because it hasn't everybody been goes, I heard, you yeah. know, a guy it, said it's not required I mean, by anybody. Right. Yeah. It's not. So the mandate, and I think the government has already said the administration has said, you know, they're not going to have a national mandate. I don't think that's going to happen. But what I have no. heard is that, I spoke to several heads of major medical centers who said that they're not doing it yet, but they mandated the flu vaccine. And, you know, the, there was one one person said that their flu vaccine uptake before mandating was in the 60 percentile and it went to 100 percent with mandate. And they had to fire a couple of people. And they said, look, you are it's one thing where you're in your in your life. The, the patients are captive prisoners. <laughs> they're, they're in there. They and you're seeing them. And if you're not vaccinated, you're putting them at risk, you know, and the protective equipment is not 100 percent always. There are mistakes you can make. Um, so, uh, you know, we may start seeing mandated uh, at medical centers, uh, mandates in, in, in major medical centers. The other thing I want to talk about in terms of uh, explaining things to people um, has to be with the way it spreads. So we owe a great debt of gratitude to the aerosol scientists. So people like Kim Prather and Don Milton and Lindsey Marr and people like Joseph Allen, um, who have been explaining to us, it's the most astounding thing, totally separate science from medicine in the past. Mm -hmm. And they've been teaching us that the, you can have these tiny aerosols when somebody speaks, or it's much more when they sing or if they talk loudly, that float across the room, it could be 20, 30 feet, 
mm-hmm. and over time can build up and accumulate, especially if there's poor ventilation, just the way a smoke, just as, just the same way that smoke can accumulate. So if you're in a room and somebody's smoking 20 feet away from you, can you smell the smoke? Of course. So if I'm inhaling smoke outdoors, now that there's the two foot rule outdoors, mm-hmm. which foot. is, which will change every four That's hours. The two foot rule. I, I heard I, on the news that uh, the CDC had said that you can be outdoors within, if you're not closer than two feet from someone, you can be maskless. Yeah, outdoors is a lot safer than indoors. I, I don't I don't remember exactly the two foot. Uh, and people are angry because they're going, well, why didn't you tell us this when we told you years ago we, we can be outdoors? Because because the big difference is that you weren't vaccinated then. Right. I heard this from a bunch of people. So vaccines work. Vaccines are astonishing. Mm-hmm. And you, there was just a report saying that there's, you know, with the Pfizer and Moderna, the two mRNA uh, uh, vaccines just came out from the from the Centers for Disease Control um, that there's 94 percent reduction after if, if you're fully immunized two weeks after the last set, last shot or the first mm-hmm. shot of Johnson Johnson. Um, but th- this was talking about the the Pfizer and Moderna. If you're fully vaccinated, there's a 94 percent reduction in hospitalization. You kidding me? I, I know. Um, and the moment I got the, my second Moderna shot, I. After I, that time had passed, those few weeks, a weight lifted. And yes. I can't, it's not neurosis. It is, for some people, extreme neurosis about the fear of the of the disease. Um, but it really did change my life. I mean, I went to a supermarket okay. yesterday with a mask on because some people are still a snuffleupagus and they're a foot away from me. And like, right, yeah. there's been no flu. The flu season's been no cold. Well, I was out of well, cold. This is my proof to anybody about the mask thing. Mm-hmm. I get colds because I travel a lot. I'm on planes. I always would tour um, before, pre-pandemic. And I would get five colds a year. I'd be on three Z packs a year. You're not supposed to be on that many. But I just did it because I don't like to be in pain or suffer or you know, oh, Bob, it's viral. Don't take the antibiotic. I'm taking the Z pack. I, I have by wearing masks. I'll talk you out of that later. <laughs> I know. I want to talk to you about it because I, I know I gotta stop taking all the yeah. meds. Antibiotic and, resistance. Anyway. Yeah, I know. I know. But the truth of it is, with masks, I haven't had a cold. Yeah. In a year and a half. So that's I'm, I'm my own petri dish. Uh, I know that masks work because I didn't get a damn cold. You know, I you I. It resonates with me when you say you how relieved you were. I got very emotional. In fact, my um, uh, it was um, it was filmed for CBS News when I was getting my vaccine, and they turned and I turned afterwards and they asked me a question. I choked up mm-hmm. um, because it. it was um, it was it it's it really surprised me. Although now that I think of it, it, it makes sense. Back last April, I was on the COVID wards. At NYU Langone Health, where I'm a professor of medicine, and um, it was brutal. We we didn't know what we you know we were th- throwing the kitchen sink at it. I was with my colleague Mark Pachapin, who's the head of GI there, Dr. Mark Pachapin, great guy. And he said, "John, forget about anything that you know that you think you know." I mean, he didn't really mean that exactly, but he was saying basically, "We don't know about this. We're learning every second something new," and people were dying left and right. It was extraordinarily upsetting to me. Um, and the reason why I came on the wards, I didn't think I was going to be helping that much in terms of, you know, here's my advice. But I really wanted to make sure that emotionally that the interns and the residents and the other clinicians and the people, the healthcare professionals, the, the, everybody, that they understood what an emotionally taxing and grueling time this was and to be in touch with those emotions because and to get help and to and to talk. And actually, they they. There is at NYU Langone Health, there actually is help and there is they, there is outreach, which did not happen to me when I was an intern. The reason why it resonated so strongly was that I was an intern in March of 1981 when I saw the first case of HIV AIDS at Columbia Presbyterian, where I was a resident. It was called GRID back then, Gay Related Immunodeficiency. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm a newly minted doctor. I'm going to save lives. And then every single person for years with this diagnosis, AIDS, that I saw died, every single one of them. Mm. I can tell you their name. I can tell you specific names. And then suddenly there were these amazing antiretroviral cocktails. 
and it got turned into a chronic illness, still devastating to many people, but you know, it's, it's not nothing. I mean, it's, it's, we need an HIV vaccine and right. I don't mean, to, I don't mean to say that there's now a cure. It's just, it got turned to, into a chronic illness, but um, fade out, fade in. And um, I'm watching the normal heart, which is a Larry Kramer play about that era. Right. And uh, it was just a few years ago. And at the very end, there are actual pictures of real people who were part of that, who died. Mm-hmm. And the play ends and uh, everybody leaves and I'm stuck in this seat and I'm in tears. And uh, Kate said, you know, what's going on? I said, I think I have some form of PTSD for that era. And I realized we never talked about it. Mm-hmm. It was, we, no, we, we didn't get help. That's for sure. Nobody addressed it. It was sort of there and devastating. And then it was over in terms of me, I went into private practice. And so I had the silhouette of that in my memory. And uh, I came in and I spoke to people about it. And, and, you know, I think people are much more emotionally intelligent now about issues like that and about the importance of addressing them as they're going on. But, you know, it's not just us doctors. I'm really worried right now as we head towards Hopefully, if everybody gets vaccinated in the United States, well, believe me, the, the world is still in for it for a while. Right. But as we return towards normal and are so eager for that to happen, don't forget what we've been through. I mean, I'm normally a very happy-go-lucky guy. I wake up in the morning with a bath. I've been feeling sad, you know, at, at, in, in, in the last months. So it's just, you know, how much can you – and I hate the mask, which – rubs on my nose it's the most thinking, uncomfortable but it's horrible. An N95 mask for me so i come back with you know marks on my nose and right it's it's upsetting you know and my strap uh, breaks all the time strap breaks so um and i worry about kids with aces adverse childhood events we know that that's really important what they go through you see what they think normal is i saw a video of a kid who was going to things on the street a fire hydrant um a parking meter, whatever they could see and thinking, pretending it was Purell, pretending it was hand sanitizer. Wow. Cause that's what, that's what she saw everybody else do, put their hands. So the sense of what normal is, of course, kids can adapt super quickly, but what's been, and then, and then people in their, at every stage, teenagers, anxiety and depression is up. Um, people in their twenties, whose careers were supposed to start taking off actors, who hit New York, ready to ready for the to make their mark, and suddenly there's no there's no acting. People that had so, places to work, all the restaurants, all of the public all, places, literally I, everything. Psychologically, mental health is so deeply it will will always be affected. This hit the world. We will yeah. always this all all generations. I mean, will be affected by this. We hear and about we, smallpox, but we yeah. are this is a hundred years. People will remember this. It, it, it's going to have a ripple effect. And we have we have to talk about how people of color were disproportionately affected by this, especially black and Latinx. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were you know, two to three times more affected. Mortality was up. I know that's true because of my research with the Scleroderma Research Foundation, that those statistics are the same, that it is disproportionate uh, with uh, people of African descent and uh, Latino and but- it, 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 it is that way with, is it that way with a lot of autoimmune diseases as no, well? It's not, it's not having to do it. This has to do at its core, Bob, with, with um, structural inequities in our society when it comes to healthcare. I see. There's decreased access to care, decreased delivery of care. You look at the uh, neighborhoods, um, there was less testing available, less delivery of uh, vaccine. So this would also apply to the autoimmune world in the disproportionate because of no. The, I think this facts? is a matter of color. This is this is you know black and Latinx. There is there's other disproportionate things that go on and inequities, but this is something that's been going on for a very long time. And I want to say specifically when people you know that it goes to the hesitancy that people of color have about getting vaccines, which is higher. Although it's it's getting better, it's higher than than white. Uh, populations. And people have pointed to things like, you know, in the past, obviously, some terrible things have happened, uh, including in the medical profession that make them distrustful. There's something called the Tuskegee study, where right. for decades, black men who had syphilis were not treated, because they wanted to just follow them and see what happened. 
So people point to that. My God. Which it was over, I believe, by the 70s, by the early 70s, I think it was over by 70s, and say, well, it was because of Tuskegee. Yes, that was one thing, but no, it's because of what's going on right now. Mm-hmm. There's structural inequities right now that we have to address. And that's something that uh, people like Joe Ravenel, uh, who's a, at, at NYU Langone Health, who's the head of the Office of Diversity Affairs, and people across the country are understanding that there's, you know, there's true healthcare inequities um, across the country. Of course, we know we know it's happening across the world. Back in, in 2010, maybe the most poignant moment for my entire career at CBS, the, which has been 15 years, was right after the earthquake, um, I went over to Haiti and I was there several times because I mean, I just, you, you fall in love with the people. They're astonishing mm-hmm. and resilient, but they, um, how much can one country take? Right. And at one point at five in the morning, I've been, I'm in Port de Pay, which is in the northern part of Haiti. It's the, the poorest town of the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's five in the morning and a woman comes in in a little shack where they're, which is their clinic, and uh, she's giving birth in one corner. In the other corner is a premature baby. And they had a, he was hooked up to an oxygen machine, which actually was just giving a couple of liters, not very much, which they take. It's a special machine that it's, it's, well, it's an old machine that takes it out of the air. It's not like an oxygen tank. It takes it from the air and concentrates it. And so he was a little bit of oxygen. So the baby had the oxygen. There's only one in the clinic. Time goes by, the woman is giving birth, and suddenly the, the baby of the woman who is giving birth, um, the heartbeat goes down. And so that's dangerous. They take the oxygen machine from the premature baby and wheel it across the room. I actually caught it on video. And they give it to the woman who's giving birth. She gave birth to a healthy baby, and the premature baby died. Now, we are less than two-hour plane flight from Miami. And in the United States, I looked up the statistics for how premature the baby was, way over 90% survival rate. Mm -hmm. But in Haiti, because of health inequity, the baby died. And that's the kind of story, (laughs) I mean, big big S, that's the kind of, of information I, 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 am, I really think is so important for a journalist to try to communicate. Um, and I interviewed, I went back, I interviewed Paul Farmer, who's another one of my heroes, Dr. Paul Farmer, who is Read Mountains Beyond Mountains. Uh, and he's written many, many other books, including about Haiti after the earthquake. But um, he actually did something about it. They, they built a new hospital in Mibale. And I went back and I, I interviewed him there and they actually separated conjoined twins for the first time in, in Haiti. And so there's progress. Um, and this had nothing to do with me doing the story. This is right. just, that, that's to say that there's hope. Um, and so you have to report on these things that are happening. You have to shine a light. The best thing I can do is to shine a light on something mm-hmm. and don't make it so bright that people shine, turn their eyes around, put it at the right amount of brightness, put it in the right perspective. Don't bring myself into this. So when I was in Haiti, I told them, if I am helping somebody, a a sick patient, which I did, turn the camera off because there is an unavoidable secondary gain for me being on, look at me, I'm helping this person. There's plenty of other doctors there. So I'm there as a journalist. I've got to be, you know, you try to be dispassionate, but you can't help it. You get sucked in. You try to give perspective. You try to tell their stories. Um, and I think that's the best thing that you can do as a journalist, you know, to just, uh, tell the, tell the stories, people tell me a story, Don Hewitt used to say, uh, for 60 minutes, tell me a story. So tell their stories, put it in perspective. And because I'm a physician, if there's some fancy schmancy medical stuff, that's tough to understand. Let me put it in simple terms. Not so simple that I'm infantilizing anybody, but simple enough so people can understand. Well, that's the gift that you are. That is, there aren't a lot of, there are not enough people like you. There are not enough. You are a, a true gift of broadcasting and of medicine. I mean, the fact that you want to practice, many people would have retired and gone on and talked to the same medical experts that you talk to, but you love your patients and you love your practice. Do you even see yourself retiring? Yeah, I, I think I'll be. Leave, I would. 
I would probably leave CBS before I would leave medical practice. I mean, it's amazing now, Bob. I've been a doctor, I cannot believe it, for 41 years next month. And I have I have a family, I've seen four generations of um, several, many that I have two generations, I'm now seeing the kids. I've given eulogies for patients. Um, it's an extraordinary privilege to take care of people, the trust that they put in your hands. Um, it's a two-way street. You're trusting them, they're trusting you. It's, it's it, you know, hopefully it's a no embarrassment zone where they can tell you everything. I don't tell, I don't tell, I don't tell, tell to my family, to Kate, and nobody knows. About are, are there any uh, patient stories, uh, one in particular that's very personal that you could share right now on my podcast? <laughs> you mean with their names and addresses? Names, address, uh, phone number. Yeah. We're going to take one more quick break because we talked longer than I ever thought we would because you're so amazing. And then we're just going to wrap it up with hopefulness. Okay. Okay. We're, we're back. Um, you did something before we continue because it is something everybody is exhausted in hearing about, this, this COVID world that we are in. And it's also something that we all want to hear about it because it's changing Literally every day you hear something new from the CDC that gets released. And I'm sure that is a huge amount of red tape to go through where they finally release something. Are you, do you, are you at your phone and throughout the day, are things just changing that dramatically constantly? Or do you not know when another shoe's going to drop? Is it a combination of all of that? Yeah, it's a combination. I would say that not knowing when the shoe's going to drop for sure uh, because there's there's always a new thing that's coming along this long haul syndrome where people months later can have brain fog and all sorts of aches and pains and, and all sorts of other problems. Uh, that's just coming to light now. We're studying that. Um, there's there's a lot of hope in terms of actual treatments. They're actually we're talking about vaccination, but there's some good treatments that look like they're promising coming down the line. Is that, uh, are, there, are those treatments for people who have been vaccinated or is it no, for, be people for that, anybody who actually has active illness? So hopefully right. if you've been vaccinated, you're not going to, not very many of those are going to, are going to have a severe illness. So for um, those that have not been vaccinated, those that choose not to be, there is hope for them as well now is what you're saying. Yeah. But I think that people need to understand that if you are not vaccinated, that one of two things is going to happen. You're either going to get vaccinated or you're going to get COVID. Because the reason why it's called a novel coronavirus is we have no immunity against it. Mm -hmm. So it's not going away. It's not going to be totally eradicated. It'll be around. You may be lucky and not and be in the middle of a herd that's mm -hmm. protecting you. But eventually, if you're traveling, if you're moving around, you know, you'll bump into it or it'll bump into you. And if you're lucky, you'll be fine. But if you want to get back to being normal, and if you want your, your people, the people you're around, your village, whatever that village is, your village, your city, your country, your world, yeah. to get back to normal, the best way you can do that is to get vaccinated. I mean, it's, a, it's really looking a gift miracle in the mouth mm -hmm. by not getting vaccinated at the end of the day. The flu vaccine is anywhere from 15 to maybe 60% effective. This is 95% effective or 85 to 95% effective. This is astonishing. It's, it's, it's a technological tour de force. It's going to get us out of this if we decide to actually get vaccinated. Um, we have hundreds of millions of doses that have been given with very, very, very few serious side effects. Mm -hmm. We talked about the one in a million from J&J &J for women. Over the age of 50, seven in a million if you're under 50. I mean, we know we we haven't seen that at all with the Pfizer and Moderna. They all, all of them seem very safe. All of them seem to be able to right now to uh, take care of the variants, which we didn't talk about a lot, but you know, eventually this is this is our moment that we have a window in time now, window of opportunity to wipe it out before because the more the more the virus multiplies, the more it has a chance to mutate. The more it has a chance to mutate the more it has a chance to mutate into what's called a variant of concern. Because most of the mutations aren't going to do anything. They'll, they'll actually may be bad for the virus and the virus can't survive. But every now and then you get a mutation that's deadly, makes it able to uh, evade, evade the vaccine or cause more illness or be more infectious. And that's the one you worry about. Those are the variants of concern. So right now the vaccines are able to handle 
them for, for the most part. So mm -hmm. this is the moment of opportunity. We have to just, as a community, all get together and uh, get vaccinated. But what about young you, people? What are the ages? Because I hear stats differently all the time. I've been told 21-year-olds don't need it, uh, but they uh, can carry it. I want to know that. I want people okay, to hear. So Tony Fauci said this to me. I know I'm name dropping, but literally yesterday I spoke to him about this because I call him in the, again, in the, you don't have to be smart. You just have to know somebody smart. So before the State of the Union, I called Tony Fauci. I called you know all, all my sources. Mm -hmm. And Tony said one of the things he's worried about is people saying, don't worry about the kids because, you know, the kids don't get that sick. Yeah, they may not get that sick themselves, but they can carry it and infect somebody else. How so, do you get a 20 year old, an 18 year old? What would be the age that you start that you want to give the vaccine to oh, a young all person? All of them. Children? Right now, it's 12 Children? to 15. Yes. 12, 12, 12 15. to 15 right now is being tested. Pfizer actually put in an application for an emergency use ap uh, application. Is it a different dosage because they're younger? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm not positive. I don't want to say that for sure. Mm -hmm. But then they're going to move down 12 to 15, then 9 to 12, then it's going to be under that. And, you know, eventually it'll be, you know, everybody down to a certain age, whatever they decide that that youngest age is. But um, everybody, because anybody who's young who has it, especially if they don't have symptoms they're again, they're out there potentially spreading it. And the people they're spreading it to may not be able to mount that that immune response themselves for a variety of reasons. They they were old and they got the vaccine. But, it, you know, the older you are, it may be harder for you to get a good immune response, a good antibody response, or they may be one of the 11 million people who have autoimmune diseases who are taking medication that suppresses their own immune system. And that means that when they get the vaccine, their own immune system is not able to make as robust an immune response, as robust an antibody response, so that you may think, you may have a sense of false confidence that, oh, I'm protected, I've got two vaccines, uh, but you may not be. And in fact, what a lot of people are suggesting now is that if you have been vaccinated and you are somebody taking medicine that could suppress your immune system, go ahead and get antibody levels checked against the spike antibody. I got to spend a second saying this, that a year ago when people got the antibodies to see if they'd been you know, infected, those were against something called the nucleocapsid. You don't have to remember that, but it was against a different part of the virus uh, than, um, than, the, than what the vaccine is eliciting antibodies to. The vaccine elicits antibodies to the spike protein. So you have to, if you've been vaccinated, you want to see if it worked, you have to get antibodies to the spike protein. Check. Mm -hmm. You get the one from a year ago that's looking for antibodies to the nuclear capsid, it'll say negative if you haven't had COVID, even if you have antibodies to the spike uh, protein. So I think people should do that if they've been, uh, if the, uh, to me personally, if I have a patient who's on immunosuppressive therapy and they've been vaccinated, I'd go ahead and check their antibodies. Right. Is that something that I should do that we all should do after nine months go by, we've had our vaccine. You know, should, we, should we get the blood test and check our antibodies? You're talking about, Bob, it's a great question. You talk about hundreds of millions of people. Do we really have the resource to do that? Or they're, you know, they're probably going to look statistically at when the response starts to wane and say, you know, you're going to, you should just get a booster at whatever a year, maybe get it along with the flu vaccine. Um, that, that remains to be seen exactly who should get the booster and when they should get it. But uh, and, and if there should be testing, I think the answer is going to be that they're probably not going to test everybody's antibodies levels because just there are going to be hundreds of millions of people you're talking to. And you have to do talking about every year, the cost of that. It may be better to uh, just get uh, the booster. And, yeah, the booster. And also, you know, you can't 100 percent rely on the antibodies. It's a thing called correlative protection, which is basically even if you have the antibodies, how protected are you? We don't know exactly what level of antibodies do you need? to be protected. Um, but the bottom line is, in the trials, 95% protection against hospitalization, oh, it's, uh, against it's, severe uh, illness, events, and 100%, and I think there was one person with an asterisk who, uh, you know, who ended up in the hospital, but there were no deaths in the Moderna and the, uh, and the Pfizer trial. And uh, now that it's out there in real life, again, you're seeing it enormously successful. And if, you, if, you're, if you're giving up and saying, well, we're only gonna get to 60%, you know, uh, vaccination don't because in Israel, that's about what they have right now. And they've had a dramatic fall in cases. So there's not, again, a thing that Tony said, Tony Fauci said to me yesterday, we look at herd immunity that it's going to click in like now you're at herd immunity. No, it's, it's gradual. And you're going to get better and better as you get more and more people vaccinated. That's right. our ticket. 
to get back to normal and or, or a sem- semblance of normal. And I'll say one other thing, which is these home kits are coming out. I've got them. She, My wife got them. So there's she's, different been, she's been cooking with them. She has. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not going to, you know, say which one. There are five of them right now. There'll be more. I'm not going to mm-hmm. plug one or the other. They're all they all have to have more than. 90% or more accuracy when compared with the gold standard PCR test you've heard about, which looks for nucleic acid, which is right. the genetic material that, you know, and the home kits awesome. need to be more affordable for people like a yes, home pregnancy they're, they're test. Right now they're like in, they're anywhere from about $24 to more than a hundred dollars. They've got to right. be three or $4 and it's got to be so that, you know, even if they're less sent, you know, there may be a problem with sensitivity where if you have no symptoms, it may just be that you're at the beginning of being infected. You don't have enough virus to test positive. But mm-hmm. if you do sequential testing every two to three days, as Rochelle Walensky, the head of the CDC, said to me uh, a couple of days ago, you will you may be negative the first time, but then you'll test positive. So it's got to be cheap enough so that it's just part of what you do. You get up, you brush your teeth, you check, your, you know, Monday, Monday, Wednesday and Friday, whatever it is that the, you know, the regimen is. Well, change is one of the hardest things mankind, womankind, humankind goes through. They don't like no. it. And we have changed. The world has changed on a dime in yeah. every way. And it it's in addition to this virus, everything has been changing. And I believe we're failing upward. I believe it's incredibly painful. I believe a lot of people have died. Or I believe that. <laughs> so, so I have some intelligence. But what I do you believe. Mean, what do you mean failing upward? I think we are what people think is doom and gloom is going to have us have much more of a learning curve as we come out of this and that it will be a thing of the past that we learned from and that changed our lives. But people think we're, we're failing. People think we are failing, you know, for politics aside, just their belief system that it's that these handcuffs have been put on their lives, but look, change is hard for everyone but at the end of the day, we won't lose people to this again. You know, we hope and we hope that the government, for example, steps in and supports home testing in the way that they should. But, you know, Bob, you worry about just going back to the way things were and not learn. You know, this is we're, we're a species that's famous for not learning lessons. Yeah. And in 2016, when I interviewed Tony Fauci for Zika, I said, what keeps you up at night? He said, what keeps me up at night? I mean, it was chilling. He described this, what is going on. Mm-hmm. A, pande- a, a respiratory virus that's widely uh, dispersed against which nobody has any innate immunity. That's what keeps me up at night. And look and at all the happened. movies that were f- foreboding. But that- there, you know, so we still, we were, we, there were pandemic plans. And back, by the way, in the fall, there was a symposium uh, to uh, uh, world leaders and, and industry and the head of the Chinese CDC was there and representatives from our, our administration, from our public health officials. And it was to see what would happen if there were a worldwide pandemic of, wait for it, coronavirus. Hmm. I kid you not. Oh this was God. months before it hit. So there was a playbook for this, which said that, you know, we're, we're, we were, that nobody was prepared enough. Mm-hmm. And it's not going to be just a matter of saying, okay, now we've learned our lesson doing, doing nothing about it. Why is this happening? So part of it is deforestation. We're, in, we're encroaching into the, t- the homes of the, the bat where we think this started. We're living next door to it now as we cut down trees. So we get infected. Uh, we have to look at climate change. What's, what's the role of that? Um, we have to be out there not just waiting for it to hit us, but we've got to go out and find it. We have to go and be searching for early warning signals, AI can artificial intelligence. There are models that the people are proposing to help us pick these things up early. We have to understand we're all in this together, and we are basically a global petri dish. It's not going to affect one part of the petri dish without affecting another. It's going to spread. Uh, we, you know, with air travel and and, and everything else. Mm-hmm. So I think I I hope that we're going to learn the lesson. There will be another pandemic. It's not a question of if. It's a, cat, a matter of when. These new viruses are happening all the time. And are we going to be able to be better at um, at reacting to it? And I will close with this, which was something that Tom Inglesby, who is an infectious disease expert at Johns Hopkins, said to me back in March 2020, when I said to him, you know, it is a natural instinct for a public official to want to reassure people. And he said, John, 
We are not departments of public reassurance. We're departments of public health. And we went back and forth a little, and, and we came to basically the conclusion that, you know, if you level with people, if you tell them the truth, the whole truth, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and mm -hmm. they believe that, then even if the news that you're saying to them, even if the information is worrisome, the very process of leveling with them is reassuring. Yeah. And that should be a lesson that we learn and never forget, that we have to embrace science. We have to let our public health officials, our scientists be the one who are communicating these very nuanced and difficult messages uh, that they've been training their whole lives for this. And when something like this happens again, and it will, the politicians step aside. They do the things that they're great at, like organizing the, the public uh, industry uh, uh, academic partnership. The part of Operation Warp Speed that works so well, which is where they got industry together with academia and the public health people and the NIH, and they figured out how to make these and make the vaccine, but they bought the vaccine millions of doses at risk, even before they knew what worked. And they said, you know, I remember Francis Collins was interviewing uh, Fauci and they said, well, you know, what are you going to do with all these millions of doses if it doesn't work? He goes, then we've lost money. But if, if, they're, if it works, we've got millions of doses. We're not right. starting from zero. So that part of it works. So I think everybody's got to know what it is that, that they do well, uh, and including government, which has a huge role and did do some very good things about this. We slipped up in terms of, of testing. And finally, we have to have a national strategy. So what we had during this, a lot of the pandemic was we had, you know, more than 50 different uh, game plans, yeah. you know, better than being one, you know, every state had one in territories. Imagine you had a football game, Bob, and you had 50 coaches. I don't want to, and five, five assistant coaches and yeah. everybody has a different game plan. And then they're calling audibles. That's kind of what happened. We have to sort of get together. We have to have our informatics, our computer systems talking to each other. There have been public health officials who believe it or not were faxing results to other public local public health offices and we're wondering why we didn't have up-to-date information. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned. There's a lot of post-mortem analysis that's going to be done. But right now, in terms of the, the people listening to this, I think the bottom line is get vaccinated, get vaccinated, get vaccinated, and listen to the advice of the CDC. Go to cdc.gov. There's a lot of great information, cdc.gov. And whenever I have a question, I Google it, space, CDC. Let's go to what they say first. And there's a lot of references. And and, and it's uh, updated literally every, throughout the it's day. It's updated every day. And yeah. you know, we're, right now, they've, they, they've got control of their website again. There was a moment where there, some political things were happening and there was some influence on what was on the website. That, we believe, is 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 over. Right. Um, and um, I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm cautiously optimistic. But this is not a time to uh, have a false sense of security. We got to, we got to finish this. We got to finish. To follow through. We have to follow, follow through, through and get as many people vaccinated as we can and also get the information out, which is what you do so beautifully. I, I'm thanking you on behalf of everybody who rely on intelligent reporting, information, medical knowledge. You are so appreciated. And I know this because I talk to a lot of people that, and you, you're just doing something really, really special, John. You're a very special man, and you're doing something for everyone. And I really, I just am so thankful of everything that you've done through all of this because you've been one of my reassurances. And I think people can really know that we are fortunate that we're, we're coming through this. And you are the best messenger practitioner that care and you care about human beings so much and um i just love you for it so well thanks that's that's beyond kind to say and well, i read it i read it off of read, prompter. well it was exactly but i had i had written something different yeah i changed a couple <laughs> things you told me to say but um <laughs> i will i will throw it back at, at you and at the arts um, which is, you know, we talk about social distancing. I never liked that term. I like physical distancing because at this time where we have to be physically apart, we've had to for so long, we needed to be emotionally connected so much. And yeah. people like you who are in the arts, you know, it's always the artists who, who if we're going to be saved, it's the artists at the end of the day who bring us together. I'm involved in something called Stars in the House, Seth Rudetsky and James Wesley 
when when Holly when the when Broadway went dark, they they opened up this website, starsinthehouse.com, mm-hmm. and uh, they had Kelly O'Hara the first night. They've had every Broadway star, Audrey McDonald. They've had Tina Fey and reunion shows. We did there was recently one from ER and you name Grey's Anatomy, uh, Love Boat, and every night at like eight o'clock, they're on. And mm-hmm. I'm the medical car. I'm, I'm the, the, the uh, they're the teaspoon of sugar. I'm the medicine. And I'm on at you know, 8.30 or so for however long explaining about coronavirus and sometimes some other things. So, you know, it's the, I've had a huge appreciation for what the arts and the artists do uh, for, for, and it's keeping our souls, keeping the flame alive, keeping us nourished um, emotionally. Uh, it's what you do. It's what the artists do. So I thank you. And, 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 all the artists who, who've done so much for us. Overall. So many have done so much. It's not just all how people want to perceive, you know, Hollywood and their soapboxes. It's people that I got into comedy because I wanted to make people feel good. And then I found out, yes, I do get adrenaline and love from it, but it's that shared experience and going back and performing with people, with an audience, being able to work with people in a movie, being, those are the show business gifts that you get. But mm-hmm. when you affect other people and can make them feel better, look at all the shows people binged to get them through this time. I mean, we never knew that television shows would have this power. They always did, but not like this. And there's a, I, I just think what you do and what you do at CBS and what you do in your life is just, you're just one of the really, really special people in the world that I have the pleasure of knowing. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bob. And right back at you. And thank you for having me on your podcast. Thank you. Tomorrow, same thing. We'll do four hours. <laughs> <laughs> I hope to see you soon. And so we'll, we'll, we'll figure that out. Say good night, Gracie. Good night, Gracie. <laughs> thank you so much. My thanks to Dr. John LaPook. What a remarkable person he is, right? I mean, he, He is someone that I go to to listen. I recommend listening 60 Minutes when he's on, watching him on the CBS Morning News. He's just a CBS This Morning. He is just a remarkable man. And uh, right, we wish he was our doctor. Uh, There's just one of him out there. And uh, he is some special person. So thank you for listening. I hope it was informative. I hope it was reassuring. I hope. Uh, and uh, do what you do, rate, review, subscribe to this podcast, follow it. Um, I'll be calling you guys at some point. I haven't been doing it lately because uh, I'm waiting for a little more kindness out in the social media world because, you know, there's a lot of a lot of mean trolls. Trolls is a real nice word for the people that do that online. You know, it's a lovely thing. They live under a bridge. They're a couple feet tall. They're nasty. They don't wash. That's what I, that's what, Trolls and bots. Let's get rid of them. Maybe we can get a vaccine to get rid of trolls and bots. Anyway, thank you, Dr. John LaPook. You're a very, very special man. I'm assuming he's listening to the end of this, which is definitely something he is not doing. I hope you guys are well. Uh, I hope this helped a little bit, if it can. And uh, take care of each other and take care of yourself and do something good for yourself today or tonight, whenever you're listening to this. All my best to you guys. Talk to you soon.